All right, welcome to the One Within All. Back to another episode of Interverse. Pretty excited today, so I will try not to mince words too long. But we've got Dylan Sicaccio returning, but this is his first time coming on as a one-on-one conversation with me. Something I've been looking forward to for a long time. If you've been listening in for the last year or at least half a year, you'd be probably familiar with Dylan's work. A book series called Spirit World that starts with book one, The Definitions, which I have drawn a lot of inspiration out of when it comes to all the different ways that I break down terms and the word magic and all of the different systems that govern our minds. And uh, something I've been interested in in a long time, but Dylan's work is one of the best I have found on the subject. And I definitely learned a lot. And once you open your eyes to this new way of seeing and interpreting the matrix code of language that's all around you, you can't unsee it. And you start to be like that guy in the matrix who's sitting at the computer and he sees the letters and characters coming down the screen. And he's like, blonde, brunette, redhead. I can see what it represents. And we do need to all get to that level. So if you are interested in Dylan's work before or after we have this conversation uh, presented to you, just go ahead and check the show notes for links to the Spirit World series on Amazon. It's a real steal considering how much research and how long it probably took Dylan to accommodate, uh, accumulate all of this information over his life. And he's given it away for $10 a book, $30 for three books that will definitely open your eyes and be something that unless you're very familiar with the subject matter, you'll probably want to return to again and again. So I'm excited to talk about some stuff that's in his books with Dylan and also just kind of going to have to address the elephant and donkey in the room (laughs) as far as what's been going on uh, this week and all of that circus uh, predictably being as chaotic and unpredictable as anyone with eyes to see would expect. So apart from Dylan's Spirit World series, I also want to let you know he's got a book series called Tale of Anora that is pretty sweet. I've read the first book. It is a fiction series that is a blend of a lot of ideas and elements from different things in pop culture that a lot of us in the age range of mid thirties or younger are going to be familiar with, particularly video games that are near and dear to my childhood. And with uh, in that story framing, he puts in a lot of the ideas regarding natural law and the dynamics of <laughs> energy in the universe that we all share and inside of ourselves. So Dylan's a pretty awesome dude and I'm glad to call him my friend. And we will do a second hour for plus members, patreon.com forward slash universe. Check that out if you're interested. Everything's in the show notes, but uh, I promise I wouldn't be too lengthy in the intro. But I have a lot to say about this guy because I am pretty impressed with all around his work and uh, definitely like talking to him and excited to get this party started. Dylan, my man, what's up? Welcome back to Interverse. Hey, Chance. Thank you for having me on. It's an, an honor and I almost don't like your long interviews because then I, it's like, wow, he's just so respectful that now I can't be silly and clown around with him. So uh, formally, it's an honor to talk to you as always. Um, you make me proud because I see you actually using this knowledge and, and doing something with it. You've done the work and that's why I agreed to talk to you. It's not because I have any uh, intention of wanting to be a voice or a, a personality in this type of uh, space. So formally, I appreciate it. Now let's let's get rid of the formality. It's like two guys shooting the shit with each other, two friends. And uh, oh, you're saying my name wrong. What's the matter with you? Huh? It's the coach. I did that to the I did that to the last guy <laughs> who also had an Italian name. So it's just not my forte. <laughs> got to learn how to say the names over here. It's Sicoccio and uh, Mr. Inter- Pocket. Yes, you can call me Pocket. If you want, if that makes it easier, you just want to call me a nickname, say Pocket. By all, that's what like, a lot of my friends say. And um, interesting enough, Shio in Italian means I know. S-C-I-O, phonetically. Not, that's obviously not how my name is quite spelled, but that's, I think, what my ancestor kind of encoded in it. Because if you were to just say the word in Italian, it'd be Sicoccio. But they say Sicoccio here. Do you think you have an uh, ancestral history of being immunized against this fear bullshit? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, you know, I don't want to say too much, but my ancestry probably comes with putting the fear in people. 
if that makes sense. I see. So in which case you also would those ancestors would know that what they're doing is like illusion weaving. Hmm. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, uh, there's plenty of other methods to get what they want out of you. Well, hey, you mentioned you wanted to like clown around. So do you want to talk about the, the clown show that's going on right now in clown world for a minute? Because uh, I've avoided all information that I can about what's up and maybe you have too, but maybe we can talk about the real world <laughs> clown clownery. Like I'll give you an example. I was just at the grocery store and I don't know, I was like selecting my hummus. I'm the one guy in there bearing my true face to the world. Everyone's smiling and cool with me. I think okay, their eyes are smiling when I talk to them. You can't see under their, their diaper. But anyway, this woman next to me in the hummus aisle was like dancing around. She's like so happy. And I'm, I make eye contact with her. And she's like, we won. We won. And I was like, what did I win? We win? And she's like, Biden. And I was like, oh. And then she goes, oh, you're not a supporter. And you can tell she's like downcast and I answered as truthfully as I could. The choice between the lesser of two evils is still evil. And I am not a supporter of evil. <laughs> but hey, I'm happy that you're happy. And I'm feeling pretty happy today, too, for my own reasons. So good for you. Thumbs up. And I, I walked away. But then on my drive home from there, the opposite side of the fence, if you will, the other 49%, I hear, I hear it's 49 versus 49. There were like 12 cars with uh, Trump flags and like stop the steal and everyone's like they're all honking to each other and like you're yeah, America and just fist bumping out their cars but it's just amazing to see grown adults so invested in a puppet show you know but most people don't believe in sorcery <laughs> yeah well do you have any you have any thoughts on the current sorcery or is it same old same old to you I mean it's the presidential freak show what I don't really it's it's one of those things that. There, I've been through this, uh, I'm, I'm 37 years old, so I've seen a couple uh, elections where they do this shit. And the last time it was kind of like this was with Bush and Al Gore. And they had these things with, called like, like dimpled chads or pregnant chads and all that garbage. And it's just like, they're going to drag this out because, you know, from one standpoint, I'm on the West Coast. I'm, I live in Los Angeles right now. Um, and... When I was, I went to bed or when I stopped paying attention to it, uh, it was like 10 o'clock at night, which is like one o'clock for the majority of Americans. I think it's like 80% of, uh, America's population is on East coast time. Trump was in a landslide. So it's like, uh, I knew it that he's their guy as always. And then you wake up in the morning and everything's kind of changed. Nancy Pelosi owns the, the voting machines. You hear all this garbage about fucking watermarks and all this nonsense. And there, it's the biggest sting operation. So you still have that trust the plan crowd coming out. And it's just, it, they're, in my opinion, and, and I'm, not, I don't, I'm not associated with people where I could have any type of insight on this anymore. But it, it just seems like, they have to do this to keep everybody divided, right? Like they have to make everything as close as possible. So half the population is going to always be um, thinking it's illegitimate, right? So it doesn't matter who wins. The puppet masters are going to stay, stay the course that they're doing. And the people on one side will be riled up and, the, one of the reasons I'm, I'm leaving Los Angeles is I've just spent the last four years uh, listening to uh, stage five Trump derangement syndrome everywhere I go at work. I can't, I'm not political, so I couldn't give a shit about it. I know what's going on. I've, been, I've seen too much. I've been around too much. So I don't have any invested information in this. And when I first got into the financial world, the first thing they told me to do was to get rid of my TV and do not watch the news because that was a mechanism of an, in, essentially enslaving people with negative cycles. And that's part of a design. So I have not watched TV regularly in close to like a decade or so. And um, I just see the same bullshit every election. And no matter who gets in, the government wins. And so as long as everybody's still participating in a slavery dialectic, it doesn't really matter who the freak show puppet is, because if you look at Trump's cabinet, 
his secretary of commerce was Wilbur Ross, the very same Rothschild agent who he worked for for 24 years that bailed him out in the early 90s. And it's on the record. You, anybody can type this into a search engine that Trump is a valuable asset. Now, who is his com, uh, treasury secretary? Uh, that would be Steve Munchen, which is uh, he, he worked for Goldman Sachs for 17 years. And he also comes out of Yale and uh, the society or the cult uh, member that was started by the Russell Trust called the Skull and Bones. So he's a bonesman. And then you had his Alex Acosta um, labor secretary, who is the very guy who gave Epstein and uh, Ghislaine Maxwell their sweetheart deals. Right. So one of the huge keys that could have brought down uh, elements of the power structure, Epstein, died on Trump's watch. Where are the arrests? You hear all these people with this uh, Abrahamic religious belief, trust the plan, you know, 5D chess, you hear God wins no matter what. You know, it's like it's all this false, erroneous religious belief that people have to get them waiting around thinking that somebody else is going to do their dirty work and change their adult diapers while the world goes to shit. And these people, many of them, are going to be called when when this system finally does break and you have a serious credit crunch and the just-in-time de- delivery system freezes, you're going to see a lot of people who are not self-sufficient and don't have any skills to barter with or any goods to barter with. You're going to see them starve to death. And, it, and the process has already started when you look at the situation we're in financially and economically with the stimulus and the closure of businesses. Um, that stimulus has stopped. So now... You know, depending on what's going to happen, most likely this is you're looking at the rolling out of universal basic income and the bells and whistles that will be attached to universal basic income are pure slavery. And they because it's all digital and it's going to be digital, they will have the means to make certain amounts that you get through that expire or lose value if you don't spend it in time. So it's not going to incentivize saving and investing. It's going to incentivize you spending that money to prop up the economy. Consume. Exactly. And so in terms of this stuff, it is so toxic that I don't bother focusing on it because this is the stuff that I had to come to terms with when I was going through my process of uh, awareness of what's going on, which took about three years and started when I was 21. And so I've been around it and in these phases, your mentality, it's very difficult to maintain a a positive outlook on life when you start looking at what's going on at the lower levels of the control system. So that's why I go more into the spiritual aspects and the religious things and, and language and symbolism Because ultimately, in all of that stuff, there is profound beauty and uh, very important knowledge that will, in fact, bring you closer to God, bring you closer to uh, what is really going on in the world. And a lot of times, people need to just shut their TV off and get off social media and go outside. And that's the real news. That's what's really going on. What you can see in nature, what you can experience in reality. And most of the stuff we are in fear about, we wouldn't know about if we didn't literally plug into their matrix and plug into their social media trends. And as somebody who has um, been in sales for a long time, studying trends, because I'm in business for myself half the time, or most all the time, but it's not a very lucrative thing, but I've had to study trends. And I see from being in in an aware position of what's knowing, knowing what's going on based on experiential knowledge. Like a lot of people came to like some sort of awakening by watching YouTube videos and reading books and shit. Not for me. I was around it. I've been around involved with this stuff. So I, my awakening came from being on the inside of what's going on in terms of association, not being on the inside in terms of having anything to do with it, but just through association. And one of the- when that happens to someone, though, like just to cut in for one second, that if you had 
continued associating, even not participating in the evil. But now you know about the evil. Uh, man, that's on you. So like, obviously you knew what you had to do and not be involved anymore. But I think we like people talk about, oh, there couldn't be some grand conspiracy that all these people know about. Well, how many things do, does the average person know about that is bad that they do nothing about? So is it really that big of a stretch that there could be a lot of it, uh, people out there that know some degree of what the cult is up to and just say nothing and do nothing because there's a big threat hanging over their head. If they do, they'll lose whatever fake livelihood they've been propped up into by association with that cult. Am I right? Yes, you are right. And that's actually a really important thing, um, to, a topic to cover. And I'm glad you brought this up because as somebody who really loves art and really my intention in life was just to produce as much beauty as I could and inspire Renaissance to lift people up in ways that art has lifted me up because that's the ultimate form, in my opinion, of ritual, which comes from the Latin word ritus, which is service to God. And what you do with your gifts that God gave you is your gift back to God. And so art and beauty and the ability to make people laugh and inspiration. And it's not just art, like what we think, like with music and maybe artwork and stuff, what you do for a living, if you're good at it and you love it, that's an art. Being a, a doctor could be an art form. Being uh, a, a free, uh, a ma um, like a mason who makes stone structures, like an actual real mason, not like a conceptual one, but like an actual builder. You're building beautiful things. You have the choice to build a shitty rundown structure that just, you know, will get you by for 20 years, or you can build a masterpiece that will be around for millennia. And the way we build things, the way we behave is an art form. It's, it's, our, it's really what's programming the world around us. And so one of the things I, um, that the entertainment industry is so important is that so many people who have these incredible gifts are not just talented, but they had to work their whole life to get where they are. And the average person who has never pursued something like that has no idea the kind of sacrifices you have to make. You can't be going out partying in high school and doing all this other bullshit in college if you're trying to be driven and accomplish something by your early 20s. You have to be working while everybody else is fucking around and enjoying life. You're dedicating yourself to improving your craft to get to a skill set, a, a level of skill that is um, at a mastery level so you can be better than the competition. And the general consensus for that is 10,000 hours of doing something that you're very passionate about till you get to a level of mastery. So if anybody wants to look up what 10,000 hours is, that's like five years of like a full-time job working your ass off at something. So if you're trying to accomplish that by your early 20s, which most people are doing, especially in entertainment, because it's not for old people, your child, your like teenage years are, have to be sacrificed. You can't be fucking around. You actually have to be working at something. So then you get, you finally not only do put the work in to get that skill set, but then you actually have to have the courage to leave the place you know and leave your family and friends to go somewhere. If you didn't grow up where the epicenters are of these uh, places, like these entertainment centers, whether it's Los Angeles, whether it's New York, whether it's Nashville, you know, Louisiana, um, you have to go far away from home and then you have to live, you know, half the time you're just moving out there with savings. So you have to get a job really quickly. You have to sacrifice your standard of living maybe to, to afford a smaller apartment so your savings can go longer. The sacrifices that people make just to get there is so intense that the average person can't appreciate what somebody is clinging to when they're made an offer, when they get to a point in their career where it's like, you either have to go along or you're, you're giving up everything you've ever worked for. And the average person is not able to give up everything they've ever worked for. So they're going to go along. And so that's the one thing that the truth, you know, all these people, these fucking parrots and everybody's got something to say, but all these people have never fucking done anything that could even come close 
to getting to that level. And they're running their mouths about people in the entertainment industry. They have no idea what it's, what, you know, some of these poor artists are faced with. I unfortunately, or fortunately, in, I, I, I just don't give a fuck. My, I have too much pride. I can't look at myself in the mirror if I have to compromise who I am to get what I want. So I always look at it as if what I want makes me have to compromise who I am and my integrity, then what I want, it ain't worth a goddamn anyway. So fuck you guys very much. I'm not letting you do any sexual shit to me and I'm not doing any sexual shit. I just like art. I don't want to get involved with your politics. You know what I mean? I don't want to push an agenda. That's not what I exist in this world to do. And so I have the luck of being strong, but that's because I come from a strong family, right? Powerful women, you know, like the women wear the pants in my family, but not in like a way where the men are pussy. Just the women are, are, are very, uh, like just, they're just very powerful. They're, they're not, while still embracing the sacred feminine of taking care of your family and all that stuff. You know what I mean? So because of that, I have the strength to resist temptation. Some of these other people don't have that family to fall back on. And if anybody's ever been involved with some of these cults, whether it's through the mystery schools, whether it's through certain corporations, one of the tools they have is recognition. And they will make you feel better about yourself than your own family and friends make you feel, right? So the power of recognition when you do something good and like bringing you before powerful people and commending you and and listing like the good things that you've done and people that you look up to are like complimenting you and applauding you and proud of you. You're not going to get that from uh, most people. So there's also that allure of being involved with power and um, the structure, right? What people don't realize is much of that uh, recognition and stuff is, is kind of insincere. And if you ever go against the grain, they're going to ruin you. But as long as you don't go against the grain, it's going to feel real and it's going to be amazing. Now it's your turn. Well, yeah, I'm thinking about a lot of stuff from what you're talking about, but to the most recent thing at the end of your explanation is the idea of flattery is like (laughs) it's actually the first the first weapon of the psychic vampire Uh, i experienced this in real life not very long ago i was at a gathering with friends i met several new people but one of the people i met this young woman who was talking to me and acting very interested in things that i'm interested in getting me to open up and talk a lot and i was having a good feeling about this conversation because she was kind of flattering and complimentary to me, kind of flirty, you know? And then much later in the evening, I'm sitting in a circle with, with her and a few other people. We're all talking and a conversation turns to something that I felt like I needed to make a statement about regarding what the truth was. I don't even remember what I was saying, but I was, I was also very, I had just gotten super high with cannabis, right? So like energetically are up, everything's kind of powered up. My sensitivity level is high. And I'm in the middle of saying something that I'm really passionate about in this vibe, like in this flow state. And this woman just like jumps up and kind of cuts in with basically like a big statist, pro-statist argument and how like she's supporting these democratic candidates for whatever fucking office. I have no idea. And why they're going to change things and why we need to like actually be involved with the state and make our voices heard and, and vote and all that. But at the end of it, I was like, I felt drained. I, could, I was disoriented. I didn't realize what had happened for a second. And she goes, after she finished interrupting me, she's like, wow, you guys feel how good the vibe feels now? It's like there was a vibe shift. And I looked around at everyone and they didn't look like they felt very good. But she would feel good. And I was like, this is like a low-level henchman of high-level energy vampires who is harvesting energy for herself using the using the other vampires like almost as some sort of egregore to call on. I don't know, dude, it was fucked up, but I had to like sing and uh, do some internal energy and body scanning stuff and like reconnect cosmic energy to the bodily energy sort of. And like I had to repair some, some dents in my energy system after it and to feel awake again, if that makes sense. And I think, I think this is really what's going on is like high level group, energy vampirism we talk about 
a lot of these things that you just brought up. I mean, first of all, the 10,000 hours thing. I guess I have quite a few things to say, but I'll get through it. Uh, one, one sort of I, uh, like point against the idea of 10,000 hours, not to contradict that 10,000 hours matter. Obviously, they matter a lot. But it's the idea that like, what is the quality of those 10,000 hours? Are you practicing the wrong way for 10,000 hours? And then can you really be a master if you weren't taught the right way to do the, you know, the process, right? And that, that, that applies differently to different fields. But when it comes to these people in the entertainment industry, to get to where they got those 10,000 plus or whatever hours it took of hard work and sacrifice to get to the point where like they're the special one, they're the chosen one, they got the status, the flattering title of whatever job or what in whatever field. Well, to get there, they had to spend 10,000 hours in indoctrination of how things work in that system and in that field and the master slave dynamics of all that. So in a way, like it's straight up a type of mind control, what, what some people go through, but even in the 10,000 hours, some people spend on YouTube thinking they're getting woke, whether it's because they're watching somebody like Teal Swan, who literally tells you this fake spiritual ass guru tells you stuff like imagine what it's like to commit suicide and think about it a lot. Like that, that's a good thing for a mental exercise for some reason, even to the point where some of her followers have supposedly even committed suicide after being really into her culty shit, or it could be the, the QAnon people, uh, even the, those that are saying God always wins. Well, you can only have one God. And if government is your God and you support government as you do, then yeah, God wins. Your God is always going to win over you. That's your master. You can't, ha you can't actually serve the real thing that is God, which is the totality of self-existing reality. You know, the, the essence of life and becoming and being itself as a verb. You can't actually serve that. And that can't win if you put fiction and status over it and try to make those artificial things come before it. But man, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm into all the stuff you were saying and, and your story is very good to get out here. It's one of a, a couple where I've had people on that were involved in some form of art that at a certain point they had to make a choice of like, I'm, I can't be involved in this culty thing. I have to go my own way, whatever that means for my level of success. So be it, but I'm not compromising. I'm not doing this culty thing. And yeah, but good on you. Good on you. And I, I'm glad that we got to talk about this. Well, just to jump in in a minute, it's like this, all this system, it's not even the fault of the system, right? Because if the masses and all the people listening, if you weren't supporting all the wrong people anyways, it would be a lot easier to just go on your own and be an independent artist anyways and gain your own massive, uh, you know, your own support base, right? The problem is, is that's hard to do because of the media control. And because everything's so monopolized and centralized and homogenized, it's very difficult for you to make waves or any type of impact. And social media was a place where you could get that done. But eventually it got too big and it started, you know, you have, once you have people on like YouTube getting more views than people on mainstream media, you have the mainstream media forces descending upon YouTube and on like Twitter and stuff like Twitter used to be friggin' awesome. Used to, Oh my God, the shit you used to be able to say on Twitter. Like when it was like the wild West and it was just like kids and shit, like having fun, like calling each other, every name in the book. And like, it was just like this really awesome place. You know, it was like a, a chat room with everybody in the world, you know, like social media is all, it, all these things were really good. But what happens is, Everybody tries to take control of it and then conform it to their whims and their perspective, how they think it should be. And that's what ultimately makes us uh, a platform or system end up failing because uh, freedom is always going to be the solution to everything. It doesn't matter what the problem is. Freedom, the solution will be found by letting freedom happen, just letting it do its thing, let people do their thing. And if you don't like something, walk away. You don't have, nobody's putting a gun to your head and saying, uh, you got to let this creepy old uh, inbred troglodyte in Hollywood suck your dick in order to get this movie role. You chose to do that because you don't have the moral fortitude to not do that. And that's really what's going on in this world is most of the people uh, 
that would criticize, you know, you know, talking about this like Godwin's thing and like the government and all that stuff, statism, which is like the worst form of religion imaginable. Uh, these people- it's the materialist version of of this, the most dramatic materialist version of religion possible, I feel like. Yeah, it's it, I mean, it's the the problem with government is it is the belief in uh, empowering one group of people to behave like a mafia and shake everybody else down that doesn't you know go along with their rules or whatever and it's just like all of these people especially that you see in the quote-unquote truth community going back to what you're saying most of them are practicing satanists but they're too fucking stupid and too ignorant to know what satanism is because they won't even actually look at it because it's like they would they think it's evil they they think everything is evil that doesn't conform with their uh religious beliefs so they don't even know what the tradition or what like any of that stuff is and meanwhile the joke is on them because they are actually practicing satanism without knowing it and thus programming their own fucking slavery that now they're bitching against or bitching about and that's what you have with the presidential freak show all i see is a bunch of status satanic bottom of the barrel garbage of consciousness uh, arguing with itself while the people who don't want to participate are like being persecuted. And we're trying to do our best to get the fuck away from all these freaks. It's like the walking dead and going back. Oh, I know what I want to say. Going back to that uh, vampire stuff. Honestly, man, one of the, a movie that really impacted me when I was a boy because the music was so good, like everything was so good about it. And every, I know when people hear about this, they're going to laugh their ass off. Like, you got to be you know, kidding me. But when you're a child and you see this movie, it's really impactful. Like in the 80s was The Lost Boys. And it's so sad to see what happened to them. To see what happened to Corey Haim. You know, he died while I was out here. To see him going from like one of the biggest stars to like a friggin' junkie selling off shit for a slice of pizza you know what i mean and i feel like that vampire allegory like it's true like remember that part in the movie where he's there like michael michael getting him to drink the wine which is really vampire blood that's going to turn him and he's doing it to fit in because this girl that you know he's 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 you know passionate about this girl and i can empathize with that so many ways you know like you might be in love with there's this girl that you love or that, you know, you're trying to be with and she's involved with these crowds and it's almost like love is blind, you know? So you'll, you'll, you'll go along with stuff you wouldn't have otherwise gone along with just because you're so, you're trying to make it. You're like, maybe, well, I know I really don't want to be at this party, but there's so many powerful people here. If I could just make some friends and network, it'll be good for me. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the idea that like, carrot and stick it's like it's like putting cheese in a rat trap that's and that's what a lot of the system is like when you're actually there and so that vampiric stuff even if they're not actual vampires the allegory is important for understanding the mentality or the consciousness of what you're around and then you combine that with the opulence like you've never seen i mean you go in some of these people's homes the average person can't imagine this kind of wealth exists, but it does. And if you did, there'd probably be a revolution before, you know, next week. If people realize how much wealth the people had who are controlling the system, they'd freak out seeing that people live like this while there's other people going hungry. That's vampirism, not just against the people that are basically to some de- i mean to some degree you choose your own path even in this system I mean, there's ways that you can make it as a slave and be a very successful slave and you know a lot of us us look down on the individuals that don't pull themselves up by their bootstraps or whatever and uh and just suck it up and go along with it and take care of themselves but there's vampirism against the earth too and I, what I, that opulence you know that even the opulence of the devices that we take for granted, like, was it really a good thing how that was pulled out of the earth or were the people that did that being exploited and vampirized? And across the board, the answer is like, yes, yes, yes. We're in hypocrisy across every, uh, oh, practically across every line we can imagine. And it's difficult to disentangle ourselves from that. Uh, wh- yeah. One thing about the the reason why, though, that, that some people are starving is, of course, 
I mean, I think this isn't uh, hopefully news to anyone, but debt-based currency, fiat currency, every dollar comes into existence as less than nothing. It actually requires more than its own value to be paid back, which means it's a game of musical chairs. There's never as much money in the system as people need to pay up their debts. Therefore, some people are always going to be poor. And the more the, that money actually accumulates into the hands of a few, the more people are going to be poor. It's uh, It's built in and like, that's not the issue anyone runs on in these fucking freak sh- presidential freak shows, as you call it. Uh, but, you know, to, to your point about the actor that you saw from Lost Boys, like his rise and fall, that was the point I was trying to illustrate with my experience with uh, a person who was an energy vampire, who, by the way, if somehow that person even listened to this and they're like, hey, that was me. I can't believe I did that. I'm not a vampire. I'm not calling you a vampire or even if you out there just have done something like that and not realized it, uh, it's kind of a survival method people do when they're low on energy. But you got to recognize in yourself, like, do you build people up falsely and flatter them so that they'll like you? And then when it suits you, knock them down a peg because you feel like you can or that you're right or you're justified or you want to judge them or in any way just negate them? Because that's what the vampire does. That's the whole point I'm trying to make is that This flattery builds you up, which is why I let that person into my energy field because I felt good about the flattery they're giving me. And I wasn't on guard because I was kind of stoned and I was around a bunch of friends in a place that (laughs) for the most part, as far as I know, most of those people I was around are not vampiric in their behavior. So just got to watch out for who's trying to give you a, a, a title make you feel like you're the heroic one because you're on the right side and then you're against them. And, you know, what are you feeding into? And we all have to really think about that. And nobody has really the idea of that there's a gun to our head even to participate in this system. That's also false. 99% of the time, there's no gun to your head. And if you are act following natural law, I mean, doing no harm, and you are pulling away from the system, any goons that try to give you a hard time if that even came to pass if you just like be respectful most even most goons even most goons will at least like not overly (laughs) abuse you like i mean we're gonna have to take on the responsibility of being our own protectors and dealing with brainwashed bootlickers right uh no matter what but it's up to us to like get rid of the fictional gun to our head that makes us believe we got to be part of this um, just on time delivery system and not be our own providers or create our own communities that can provide. We got to get rid of that idea that there's a boot on our neck. The boot we we put the boot on our own throat with our our belief and our love of government and the legal system as our god. And okay, so there's something I really want to clarify in because I I got pretty far away from it just now and I talked a lot, but this is really good stuff. And you brought up the fact that a lot of people are Satanists and they don't know what that is. So I'd love for you to explain that. I've got some etymological thoughts on it, but like what is the adversarial spirit in your opinion? That is what we're talking about when we say Satanism. Do you want to talk from an, the actual astrological meaning of it? Or do you want me to just go through briefly what Satanism actually is? I think we can do both so that we can see what, like why it's the idea of being adversarial and then what that's practically, what that practically looks like um, going against natural law, right? Like first the idea, of course, that it's the opposite end of the ecliptic, uh, we can get into that first, but let's let's see if we can break this down some. And you just go for it, and I'll fill in where I think that there might be something else I wanted to clarify in there. Okay, give me one second, because I'm just... Um, so, basically... Satan comes from an older Hebrew word that means adversary. Now, what a lot of people don't realize, first of all, they don't know what a Hebrew is. They don't know, um, 
they don't have a, a, f a strong foundation in terms of uh, cultural history. If that's, that's probably the best way I can explain it without triggering people. Um, but much of the, the names, especially of like the figures and characters that we have that we believe had some sort of historical or literal significant are actually taken from allegories that were astronomical texts. And so you can think of this as either the people didn't know what they were looking at and were just stealing those traditions and pawning them off as their own history, or they knew they were astronomical um, allegories, but they gave those to the masses. So the masses would never actually know the history of what's really gone on in this world so that they're easily conquerable. Now, that being said, Satan, the adversary, is an astronomical term that corresponds to the sign that is opposite of what the sun is in. So uh, one of the more popular or renowned adversarial elements would be Aquarius and Leo. These signs, every sign that's opposite of each other is its adversary, right? But specifically, you will see this encoded in um, stories like King Herod beheading John the Baptist, right? And this is actually an astronomical occurrence that happens on August 30th, approximately around 3 a.m., and for those of you who want, I'm not going to explain everything for you, but you could take out a planisphere and contemplate that. Look at Aquarius and Leo and how they correspond to each other in those positions. And then imagine why someone would depict Leo, King Herod, cutting off the head of Aquarius or John the Baptist. And it'll make sense to you. The average person is not going to is going to think what I'm saying is crazy. So I'm not going to really go into it. This is for, if people want to go a deep dive, you can read my books. Another great uh, one that often confuses people when they read scripture literally would be Paul and Saul, right? Paul would be Pollux, right? To bring forth light, but also it's the root there. It also involves pollution. Whereas Castor, the other brother of Gemini involves purity, Castus. In Latin, um, Paul, when the sun is opposite uh, of, let's say the sun is in Gemini, Pollux, right? The adversary would be Saul, Sagittarius. So that's why you see this theme of casting the riders into the, the horse and his riders into the sea. So when the sun is rising in Gemini, at the horizon, you will see Sagittarius going below the horizon or being cast into the sea. And many of these figures are fishermen because in the regions where a lot of these scriptures were developed, you see the sun rise or set on the Mediterranean Sea or on another sea that's nearby, right? Like the Black Sea or, you know, wherever, wherever they're coming from, the Red Sea, all this stuff. So many of them are fishermen. Or many of them, you will see that these parting of the sea allegories or the Red Sea. You know, if you've ever seen the sun set over the sea and what happens to the color of the sea as the sun sets on it and what it appears to look like, how it's walking on water, etc., etc. So there's an ast astrological element that goes back to this. Now, what you have in the modern tradition of what we call Satanism is the taking of that theme but then creating uh, more of a, a tradition around that idea and observing mankind at their lowest form of existence, which is really just catering to their animalistic tendencies. And so when you're looking into things like that, you're, you're basically, there's four major tenets. And if anyone really wants to go into this, probably the best person is a former priest that was appointed priest by Anton LaVey uh, who left that tradition when he figured out what was going on. And that would be Mark Passio. 
And he has gone through ad nauseum, I might say, but actually going through the literature and showing you point by point, in summary, the four major tenets of Satanism, the ideology. First of all, Satanism, nobody in Satanism actually believes there's like a real entity who's actually a legitimate Satanist. They, Satan is the ego. And Anton LaVey, in a book called The Satanic Rituals, writes about this. He said, the number of Satan, let it know, be known that nine is his number. Now, that's kind of a nod and a wink to 666 because 666 added up equals 18. And this is using theosophic um, uh, addition, or uh, sorry, reduction. Eight and one, 18, eight and one reduces to nine. Nine, no matter what you multiply it before, and this is what Anton LaVey explains, this is why nine to them represents Satan, because no matter what you multiply nine by, no matter how complicated it is, it's always going to return to itself. So I don't know what your um, birthday is, but let's just use your birthday as, a, as an example of this. What, what's your birthday, like including the year, unless that's too personal? No, I'm cool with it. It is 322-1989. So I'm just going to do 322-1989. So that is 3,200,021,989 times 9. That would give you 28,997,901. Use theosophic reduction and add all those up and tell me what you get. Can you do that? I'll, I'll walk you through it, right? So let's just take the first 28. Write these down, right? Or do you have the means to do that? I have it in front of me on a calculator. Okay, great. So 2 and 8 is 10, right? That's going to be 1. 9 plus 9 plus 7 would be 18. So that would be 25, which is 7. And then in the last three digits, 9 plus 0 plus 1 is 10. So that's going to be 1. So we have one. You have one plus seven plus one, which is nine. Yeah. So you see? So that's why Satan corresponds to that number to them. But that doesn't mean number nine is bad because number nine is, uh, you could, it, it, people have written books on the significance of all cultures on the number nine because it is a, a name, a, a number of divinity, a number of deity. How many months of, is a woman pregnant? Nine months. And then life manifests. It's the one through nine. And then we have to go through 10 where you have to use another a numeral, the zero, to indicate another octave, if you will, almost. It's kind of like another level. So the, the Inead of Ineology, the ninefold nature of nature. Yeah. Really. And so that's, that is what, it represents the Satanist. It's the ego. So now when you can understand that, and this is not the divine ego, it's the material world, our individual lowercase egos, the self, the lowercase self. So the four major tenets of Satanism is as follows. The first is self-preservation, no matter what. And so that one of the things that goes hand in hand with Satanism is solipsism. And it's the idea that one can never really be certain about the existence of other things other than oneself. And so if this is it, some of these people, they look at it. This is where that um, we're in a construct, a simulation, right? Because if they can look at this like their own personal video game and everybody else as an NPC that is just there for their uh, amusement or their, their reality construct then it doesn't matter when they kill things or it doesn't matter. Like you said, when you're talking about the phone and all the shit or like the uh, hybrid or electric cars and all the mining for cobalt that people are being exploited for in Africa, nobody cares about that at a satanic level because it's all about self-preservation. Fuck all those people. I want that phone. I need that phone to do my podcast. You know, that's kind of what we're looking at. So self-preservation first and foremost then the second major tenet is um, moral relativism. And that is another tenet that's based on the solipsism. 
If there is no truth because it's all relative, right? Relativity, that's why they gave us that Einsteinian relativity. Never mind the fact that that guy married and banged his first cousin and is an inbred troglodyte who is none of his uh, theories are science, right? He's, a, he, is, he's just a puppet, just like everybody else that's been science put fiction forward. writer. Yeah. So this relativism, moral relativism, comes from this idea that there is no such thing as truth. You're, you hear this all the time, especially in the, like that new agey, like uh, kind of like that, like s- that fake ass spirituality bullshit that you see, especially in L.A. Or they'll it's, say everyone has their own truth, which is the same thing as saying. I was just saying it. Yeah. Your, yeah. Everyone has their own truth. Your truth is not my truth. Our truth is different. And that that stems from the fact of this relativism idea. So that if there is no such thing as truth right? Which in another word could be saying, if the natural world doesn't exist, if reality doesn't exist and isn't observable, knowable, um, and discoverable by all, then I get to decide what's true and what's right based on my whims. And that is what we have today is people are doing, quote unquote, what's right for them. I just got to worry about me. I just got to feed my family. So you, you, you have no problem stealing freedom for a paycheck or following orders to kill everybody else. Or, you know, if you're in uh, uh, Liverpool right now, being in the army and, uh, you know, putting on these like garbs that make you look like a nurse and you're giving people, um, you're piercing their mucous membrane with the frigging COVID nonsense tests, right? That's, you're doing what's right for you because that's your job, right? That's moral relativism. It's, doing what you need to do to what you believe is required in order for you to survive or in the interests of your own self-preservation. So that's how those tenets tie into each other. Then the third tenet is this idea of social Darwinism, which is where you see the evolution ideas that they had to put out. The survival of the fittest. And that's this kind of idea that... uh, you know, to the victor goes the spoils. And that you see that encoded in the scriptures as well. So the Abrahamic traditions are forms of Satanism as well, once you actually understand what satanic uh, tenets actually are and not what you think they are based on your, what your priest said or what Hollywood, you know, depicted. And so this is the idea that might is right. And you're going to see... In survival situations, this unfortunately is what the animal kingdom devolves to, is what human beings devolve to. And they will often compare us to animals, but animals cannot sit here and have a conversation like you and I are having about morality, about higher forms of existence. They don't have the conscious consciousness or the conscience that we have. We have a higher capacity to be better than that, to rise above that. But the dark occult will always cater to the material lower nature and never cater to the higher spiritual nature. And that's why they do things like inverting the pentagram, right? So when you see the upright pentagram, you will see the four elements and then spirit or the quinta essentia, the fifth element at the top, which is in our mind. That's the God mind, the optic thalamus. That's what you see on, they put it on the money in the churches and everything. They want you to ignore that, invert that, and cater to animals. You're just an animal. Look at nature. The animals rape each other and kill each other for food and don't give a shit about each other for bait, except for what they're, na- you know, they'll pervert that and confuse the natural world with morality and thinking that uh, the natural world, because beings of lesser consciousness do that, that we're supposed to do that with each other in our own constructs. And that's why we are where we are. That's why there's all these endless wars. It's just, I'm running out of this. So I'm sorry, I hate to do this to you, but I got to rob you. And in order to rob you, I know you're not going to just let me rob you. So I got to go kill a percentage of your population and force you into domination and submit you. And then I'll take everything I want after I've, you know, reconstructed your government based on my whims and destroyed, you know, your political and religious systems and everything else in your culture. And now you're going to be like us. And that's why everything is so homogenous in the footprint of America 
is everywhere, but not America. I should say the footprint of the United States corporation that's being used by, you know, foreign entities to do their bidding. And most places you go around the world are going to have similar systems to the United States. The reason for that is to keep commerce flowing freely, which is actually war. Commerce is war the way it's done now, because it's exactly like what you said. Um, I, I need to take from you to get by. I'm just doing what's right for me. So I got to charge you however much I can get away with and not treat you like you're a family to me and just hook you up however I can to help you. Charity, that is, which is actually the self-evident law of things, not the fake self-evident law of the jungle, as they call it. Yeah, well, the law of the jungle is actually just no law at all. That's um, true, <laughs> true anarchy, as in not even uh, a natural law or the, the God of reality or the, the totality of reality, life itself as, as the, the lawgiver, if you will. But so in the second hour, I think a good place to go would be to talk more about commerce and how it relates to war and even symbolically with M Mars and uh, the, the sea level shift, if you will, that we're going through in terms of things going from Aquar um, Piscean and watery to Aquarian and, and air based. But I'll, I'll say a few things about this idea of Satanism to wrap up the, our first hour conversation here. Because I think this is on really the other side, stuff. chance. I got to interrupt you. On the other side, you need. Uh, I just got to finish the tenets of Satanism because we can't leave them hanging like that. Because so, just remind me, social Darwinism is important to the divine right of kings and all that stuff. And then we got to talk about the fourth major tenet. On the other side, for the paying audiences. Yeah. yeah okay. Good idea. Yeah. We don't want to leave the because you got to tie it all together. There's more to it. But uh, let's talk about real quick this idea of what is spirit spirit is the thing that motivates you you say someone's got spirit whenever they're uh, passionate at what they're doing spirit is what gives you the care to do this or that so it's a thing that governs your mind and then your mind governs your body what mind control really is is the not really actually the controlling of the mind it's the removal of spirit if you have the person remove their own spirit from the equation then you have two-thirds of a man What's two divided by three? 0.66666. That's it right there. That's the new man that they want to create. And uh, the key to getting someone to believe that they even have the license to act outside of the self-evident natural law of do no harm and charity unto all is, uh, the, is what is adverse. Okay, so the adversary, back to this Satan concept, Adverse means it's that which is against or antithetical to. If you think about an opposite of that word, you would actually get universe. The universe is all things together in wholeness and harmony as one. So that's reality itself. So even like the idea of Jehovah or, or the only way to conceptualize God that is not idolatry is as the verb of being itself, self-existing, the universe as a totality, all reality and creation. So what's adverse to that? Adversarial, satanic to the universe, adverse universe, that which is artificial. And so not that all art is bad, but something that is not in nature before we got there and won't be there after we got there, a lot of things fit that bill. And if we're putting those things before the laws of nature, the self-evident harmony of all things in universality, then we're going to have a bad time. That's how we invert things. That's how the inverse of brethren work. They put the artifice before the nature. If your art is in harmony with nature, you can exalt nature. You can do amazing, beautiful things. We have so much freedom. It's our rights are negative in nature. It's what we shouldn't be doing. It's all we really have to worry about, not like trying to come up with every little thing that we can do and are allowed to do. That's what governments do. They give people and groups the right to do things that they wouldn't have had in nature. It is li licensure to do evil. Man, I'm having some crazy deja vu right now. So let's, uh, I may have had more things to say about clean, that. Clean yourself up. <laughs> ah, but it's just is... blew a load. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. It's a good place to, no, to it's tie fun. We, And we got a lot to go through. And, you know, just, uh, just never forget the old Akkadian word, which, which Magi is derived from, is Imga. 
It's where we get imagination, magi, imagination. It's all the use of the mind. And that's what makes us special. That's why we can create seaworthy vessels. That's why we can create structures that stand uh, a really long test of time. That's why we can create ideas that can never die. It's why we can do all this amazing things that either raises people in consciousness or destroys them in consciousness is the use of our mind. Our mind, specifically our imagination, is the real key to this, to what makes us different. That's a good point. And to wrap things up, uh, I'll give you the chance to let people know anything you want them to know about if they can talk to you or not or how. But the uh, the imagination is super powerful, right? Because I, I wanted to make sure in this outro of the first hour that I let people know that not only do you have the books, the Spirit World series that go through in detail the things that we've just been dancing around, because like we can't show you the phonetics and show you words next to each other in a conversation. And honestly, if you don't care enough to go find out and, and go do the research, we're not doing you any favors by just vomiting out our regurgitation of the stuff that we've researched. You know, I think this conversation has done a good job of being in this, this, the zeitgeist of the now and the spirit of what we're both just thinking and feeling more than trying to construct some sort of uh, path that people can follow. I think that you got to follow your own path and, and getting into the spirit world books is a good way to do it. But the imaginativeness of the tale of Anora books that you've got, and I'm excited to read the next couple ones because they, the first one was really fun. Yeah. They're easy to get into. They're not, it's not a super long read that you need to like worry about committing yourself to. Just go check it out. It's so cheap on Amazon. Dylan's practically giving away those Tale of Anora books. And it, if it's too boring to get in and read something like uh, Clint Richardson's work or the Spirit World books that are so detail oriented, go for the fiction because when it's aligned with nature, this imagination is able to do things and speak to us in ways that we wouldn't otherwise be able to receive that message. It goes, it bypasses the left brain filter, goes right into the right brain, hits you in the feels, which is your consciousness. And, and those stories that Dylan wrote and many other great stories can do that very thing. So I encourage you guys to get into reading because that's another way to expand your ability to communicate. I think you underestimate how you're not reading is causing you to not be able to articulate and causing you to rely on the same phrases and crutch words all the time and constantly. Like you and I, we read, we can go back and forth and have articulants, you know? So I, I want people to read. I hope they check out your books and I really like them and uh, think that you practically give them away. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks That's for, a really thanks. great compliment. And uh, I, I really appreciate that. And yeah, and, and reading is one of those things where it's like, it gives you the recipe and your imagination does the work. So it's really good to stimulate your imagination through reading, even though it's sometimes uh, not like the first go-to Every medium is important. And, uh, you know, and other than that, thank you for all that promotion. And it's, it's really fun to talk to you. And, you know, in terms of people finding me, I'm not into that anymore. I pretty much, I'm, I've, I, I've retired from my penniness life of doing this and uh, I'm starting over in life. And so I'm kind of just like, I kind of like the idea of just being exclusive with people I trust. I'm, in, I'm getting kind of like a monogamous relationship with you and Crow and Jason. <laughs> Well, you're, you know, you're becoming the private man instead of the public man. There's a lot to that. And I respect that. Man. Oh, real quick. The tale of Honora. Speaking of that, Honora is a play on the word honor. And this whole system is about staying in honor. And people need to do that not only in the legal world, but in reality. Your honor, there's no getting it back. God's watching you. I don't care what you think God is. I don't care if you think God's that tree uh, next door, on, across the street, whatever. Nature, everything, the cosmos, the stars, everything. It's not just people that are observing your behavior. So you remember that when you do something because solipsism is a trap that the dark occult of this world gives to the useful idiots that they're going to control that that way they can always keep them under some sort, some sort of like under their thumb, whether it's through blackmail and everything else or whatever else but the people running this system they know what is going on and they do not practice solipsism themselves that's why they don't get their hands dirty yeah i think okay this is a really interesting last point you just made me think of but like real privacy 
has nothing to do with being uh, secluded and able to act in an actual isolated vacuum. No matter what, you know what you did. You're there with you. God knows what you're doing, even if you think you got away with something that nobody knows about or you did something that a victimless crime, as they call it, did something dishonorable. Well, it's all recorded in your very own essence, which is life itself and spirit, spirit being the information record of everything that's ever happened in a, in a sense, like that's part of reality too. That's, <laughs> it's always there. So yeah, that's, that's great, man. And um, <laughs> we'll, we'll just catch you on the other side. Otherwise we're going to keep going. It's been super fun. Really glad we have this monogamous relationship. Uh, and, uh, it's like a monogamous three-way. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I'm glad that the audience gets to be in there too. I, I think this is That's just because you guys actually do the work. You have a track record. You're consistent and you're not just chasing trends. A lot of people out there right now, they just chase trends and lead their, they build their audiences and lead them astray. And I am not about that. We're, we're not, we don't do that. We're, we're playing for you people like you and I, or individuals, humans, whatever people's not really the best word. Guys like you and I are playing for a higher audience. We know there's something other than this material garbage and attention that all these people are seeking. And so that's why I trust people or guys like you. Oh, fuck, I'm so fucked up with this uh, legal stuff. That's why I sure, trust man. guys like you guys. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah, dude. And you don't have to edit that out or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm just, it, it, you, people see how easy it is to trip up over this link language that they've created, you know, because it gets ingrained in you. But I trust individuals like yourselves because you're not just providing infotainment. You are working your ass off in your private life doing the work. And it's, it's shown adverse universe. You're doing this work and bringing things to the table that other people did not bring to the table. And that's amazing. And that's why it's uh, a joy to be, you know, on your podcast versus just, you know, people who hear this and go, Oh, can I get his number? I want to touch base with him. Uh, you can do that through Interverse Podcast. I'll go on a live stream maybe with both of you or whatever, but I'd rather just kind of be exclusive with people I trust. I feel you. And uh, uh, let's remind everyone too that probably by the time this comes out, there's an episode with you and Crow and Jason, which is really awesome. And yeah, what, to what you said, uh, if, I think if I was pursuing growing my audience and trying to follow trends, then three, four, whatever years into doing this as I am, I'd have more than a thousand people tuning into this right now. <laughs> yep. uh, but those thousand people, I'm happy that it's those people. And Just I, remember in this and everything yeah. in life, quality over quantity, because a lot of those people that chase the trends, you know, they, they first started leading people astray with this pump in that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Then it was the Trump train. Then it was the QAnus. Uh, and we can go into some of that like uh, in with code words because that's pretty in interesting that nobody's really ever brought to the table that I know some things about that. And uh, all these people lost their channels and rightfully so because these people bring on known fucking liars and they don't vet their guests. And some of these people, when I had a big channel, not big channel, but like when I had like 70,000 subscribers on like Twitter, these people only had a thousand. Then you see them do this garbage and then they build their following up over 600,000 because they're playing, even if it's not intentional, they're playing and catering to that religious zealot class that's looking for a leader to shepherd them rather than realizing that God gave them the gift of being their own shepherd. And if you're not being the own shepherd of your life, then you're going to be a sheep. Cue the music. Cue my exit music. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we... we we out. Uh, plus people see on the other side. Dylan, this is awesome. Everything I could have hoped for. So strong I had deja vu. But we'll wrap up the first hour. Thanks, man. Everyone, check out Spirit World or you're missing out on great stuff.
All right, friends, we are here again at the end of the show. And what a fantastic podcast that was. Dylan's the man. I have been <laughs> working on obtaining his friendship for this year, like earlier in the year. When I came across his work, I, I uh, as soon as I checked into it, I was like, oh, this guy's got some really interesting things to say and great things to point out. And he synthesized ideas that I had come across from so many other teachers into really a comprehensive but concise way of looking at the big picture of things. Of course, it's not exhaustive. I mean, there's always going to be more books to read, more knowledge, more information. But Dylan's book's a great place to go if you are at all interested in breaking into the word magic side of exploring our <laughs> legal word matrix of uh, control, how this whole government thing works, how and why we are enslaved to things that are evil without seeming like we have anything we can do about it. And if nothing else, I would like to think this conversation has pointed to the fact that there is something we can do about it and that it begins with rectifying our own understanding of right and wrong, however we can, and getting back into alignment with natural law, the only actual truth that exists in the laws of nature, reality itself. So, man, Dylan, if you're tuning into the outro, thanks again for being on here. Really glad that we're homies now. It's always fun to talk with you and you're, you're a great dude. And, uh, Appreciate, I appreciate you guys for listening to this and being respectful, <laughs> you know, because I think that maybe people that do work like Dylan has had to, done, like do work that Dylan has done, sorry, <laughs> caffeinated, they get a lot of flack probably for what they're putting out from whatever type of cult member that they might encounter. You're uh, offending my cult with this statement or that statement, what, whatever belief system it is that is offensive or offended easily. You know, I haven't had to deal with that. The audience of this show, you guys are cool. Nobody's like, very. Like, it's so uncommon that I get some kind of a troll person. And if anyone does ever troll with a comment, it's always some random obvious troll. It's not like people claim to like the show, but then they give me all kinds of shit. <laughs> I don't know. I think some people have a lot more stress out of the individuals they connect with online online and you all out there are amazing wonderful so far i mean a lot of you are silent and supportive and that's cool and then a lot of you are now good friends of mine that i talk to through the internet and man it's helped me get through a year that has been pretty isolated uh for all of us probably but <clears throat> yeah got a a lot of appreciation for you guys I have to be real about that and I also appreciate the ones that support the podcast with financial support as fictional as money is and as much as I talk about it, how bad it is. <laughs> Hope you understand I'm just like you. I'm hip hypocritically trapped in the use of this type of thing for now to get the food from the big uh, rectangle building that has all the just-in-time deliveries. Anyway, five bucks a month. It's really not that much to ask for. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I hope to have given you free content that was more than adequate considering that it was free. <laughs> uh, Five dollars a month, that's like, I say it all the time, it's what you tip a server. It's basically, it's at this point in inflation, pretty soon it's going to be practically nothing. I'm, I'm going to wish I had a higher price of admission, but you guys, if you want to support me, that's how you do it. Patreon.com slash interverse. And you get the second hour of this podcast where Dylan finished talking about the tenets of Satanism, which is very important because it's not what most people think. The worship of this like dark entity, the red skinned lizard man with a pitchfork and a tail. Satan. Actually, it's the adversary. Anything adversarial to what is universal, <laughs> which means anything antithetical to wholeness or reality. That's all that Satan is. So we talked about the ideas behind what Satan is as well, the concept. And of course, that the entity does not exist because it's a representation of non-existence itself. So <laughs> how could non-existence exist? It can't. It doesn't. That's the whole thing. And uh, back to money. I mean, that's what money is. It's non-existence. It's actually almost even like negative existence because it's debt, but it's worth nothing. Other than maybe like kindling if it's paper money, but this ether based currency stuff, it's not real. 
it might be a helpful tool while we are in whatever transition period and reset we're in for some of us to get more funding than others, like because we played this Bitcoin game. But at the end of the day, it's all moving towards a more locked down type of economy and society. And that's not to scare you. That's to just like let you know that this is what society does. This is what it means to be in that form of egoism, which is personhood or identifying with a self that is a noun and a property of the state. Therefore, because that noun was created by the state, you're not a noun. You're a verb. You are being, not a being. You catch my drift? It's a really important thing to recognize that you are what you are in the moment right now and nothing else, nothing more. Your history is a fiction, believe it or not, because your history is only words. The feelings and the memories that you have and the images that come into your mind, even those are through the lens of your imagination and they are recreated and represented and repackaged to you every time that you access them because they are, have no other existence other than through that imagination. And it's not to, obviously, I have nothing against the imagination. It's a big part of the show, but we do have to just like put nature before fiction. And you're going to hear me say a lot of that. I hope it doesn't bother you. Fiction, fiction, fiction. Because <laughs> um, uh, at the beginning of this show's inception, it was all about art. And now I'm like, it took a few years, but now I get it. Now I know what art is. Art is artificiality. And it has good applications and bad applications. And the word technology means art. And all of our technology is art. So there's a lot to that. Um, man, what else did we talk about in Plus? I started off telling you about stuff in Plus And I'm not doing a very good job of selling it to you because I haven't told you anything else that was in there. But we did get into the idea of like how to be a regenerate individual spiritually, like what that means, regenerate, and how that ties into nature itself as the self-existing, perpetually regenerating spiritual phoenix that is nature and why that we have that nature in ourselves in a spiritual way to become a whole man or woman. <laughs> <laughs> and not be two-thirds uh, spiritually dead, two-thirds a man, two divided by three, the number of the beast, 0. 0.666 repeating. Yeah, I mean, that's what all this is really for. If you can get a handle on how the symbols and language are spiritually re removing your spirit from the equation and making it into an automaton with a programmed mind, then you can become immune to it. I think symbolic liter literacy really is like psychic self-defense and immunity. I say it all the time. So I'm sure you'll get something out of the second hour if you t tune into it. It's like every other show. At that point, we're really warmed up and we get even deeper. And man, I think we went like over 20 minutes extra. We went long on the first hour. We went long on the second hour. This is nearly a three-hour show for Plus. Wow. And I don't regret it by any means, of course. Like I'm excited to have a chance to talk to Dylan at all. He's obviously like a private guy and very picky and choosy about who he's going to do something like this with. Makes me feel kind of special that I can have a conversation at the level that we had and that I feel like this is the type of thing I would have wanted to hear if I was looking for a podcast to listen to today. And that's ultimately always been my goal. And I hope that that works out for you, that I'm making the show that I want to hear. I hope that you can come along with me on the journey as you have been. If you're new to the show, there are so many good things in the archive. And if you're about to go digging through there, consider Plus, even if you only want to do it for a month, because if you get halfway through a show that you really liked and then it's over and then you bounce to the next show and you listen to 10 shows in the archive that way, and then you decide you want Plus later, then you got to go restart in the middle and you might as well do it all in one. <laughs> I'm trying so hard to sell it, <laughs> but I, yeah, I need your help. It'd be awesome if I got it. And you get something out of it. But what else is really important to talk about? I mentioned maybe talking in detail about the whole like age shift and the Aquarian stuff, like why terminology related to currency and banking is shifting into a more etheric or air-based thing. But you know what? That's all I'm going to say about it. Think about that for yourself. Look at the fact that money is in the cloud now and data is in the cloud. And before it was in a current on the the currency was in the bank, you know, the river. Think about it that way. And I'll just give you one other little tidbit. The word bench. You ever heard you may approach the bench in re reference to a judge? The bench used to be called the bank because the judges are bankers, magistrates are bankers. 
everything revolves around money because money is the ultimate form of fiction because you value nature in that which does not exist artificial value the whole problem of everything going on in reality that creates this false ego is the false valuation of this or that you falsely value yourself as a noun or as a status you falsely value your worth and your net worth with money and we do really gross things in form of grocery <laughs> grossing up a bunch of items for cheap and selling them for more than we made them for. And we've all been conditioned to do this for survival and it's what it is, but man, I guess I'll stop rambling and get out of here. You know, I I'm going to play out a, a track by lucid again, big surprise, but he did put out a new album and it's really good. And I want to play the song Mayan because it just kind of makes me feel a little loco in a good way. And I hope you like it too. There's a lot of ways to support the show, by the way, if you are not interested in signing up for a $5 a month plus membership, you can also leave a review on iTunes. If you're a plus member and you never left a review on iTunes, help me out, friend. <laughs> you're already a helpful friend. Help me out a little more. Write something nice in there or just leave the five stars. If I come across any reviews that are new, I will definitely read them in an outro in the future. And, and you know what? I'm going to just check right now. And uh, you get to watch me be excited or disappointed in real time. Oh, man, there's a new one. What do you know? <laughs> cool. Okay, so there's a new review here. So, you know, use this as an example, what you might write if you wrote something. But from Okara Love on the, the 2nd of November. Wow, with four W's. So that's a lot of wow. This podcast encompasses topics that are much needed in the narrative today and the depth is awesome the host and guest speak with such fluidity and the concepts are easy to grasp wow that's what i love to hear thank you thank you okara love great so yeah you could do that if more people leave reviews more likely that new individuals will discover the show on itunes just randomly doesn't ever hurt and it's a free thing you can do um so yeah go check out the show notes for links to patreon to the iTunes to leave a review to like do the affiliate shop on secret energy where you can buy some cool stuff and I get a small commission and it costs you nothing extra. There's ways look in the show notes. If you want to know more. Oh, and that's where links to Dylan's books are. If you can't look up spirit world on your own, do it. It's a quick read. You could be through that book in a week or two, the first one, and you're going to want to read the second one. If you read the first one, I devoured those books really rapidly and greedily and happily appreciatively and learned a lot and i plan to return to them and reread them and reference the ideas that i pick up out of those books in my future work because you know what i haven't admitted this to very many people but i'm pretty sure i'm supposed to write a book someday <laughs> we'll see when and how that goes but if a lot more of you were supporting me through Plus, it would be a lot easier for me to put the time and research and energy into the writing of a book. So, hey, if you want it, then uh, you got to ask for it. Vote for it with your dollar. The only real type of voting that exists in uh, this demon crazy democracy. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, check the show notes for everything. I love you guys. I'm getting out of here. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. Love you, man. Looking forward to talking to you again in the future. And that's all, folks. Take care. Much love. Bye-bye.
Where we started 